five. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful episode of My EdTech Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful morning, or it may be afternoon where you are, or maybe already into Sunday, wherever in the world that you may be. Thank you so much for making My EdTech Life part of your day. We really appreciate all your likes, shares, and follows. And as always, we always strive for excellence to bring you the best on EdTech topics or on anything education that is happening. And I am really excited because today I have some amazing guests. We have SJ Bolton, who is joining us, along with Bonnie Nieves. So I'm just really excited to talk today about Labster. We're going to be talking about virtual labs and how we can engage learners through this through the learning, through Labster. So I'm just really excited as a former science teacher to just go ahead and dive into this show. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, before we get started, SJ, if you can give us a little brief introduction of, of yourself, where you're from and the work that you're doing. Oh, cool. So thank you again, Fons, for having us here. It's, it's so exciting to be on a live podcast as well. Always a pleasure. Um, <laughs> so I'm based up in Northeast England um, in a place called Newcastle. And my entire teaching journey has kind of taken place in northeast England up until I joined Labster. So my background's in biomedical and medical education. I studied pharmacology at bachelor's level and then cellular pathology for my PhD. Um, and somewhere along the way, I ended up building robots for a bespoke automation company because that's what you do with a pharmacology degree. Um, after then, I got into science communication, started teaching within, again, Newcastle University here in the beautiful northeast um, and found Labster um, as a way of kind of one, increasing my footprint as an educator. I went from 2,000 students to 2 million in about two months, um, but joined as a simulation director to build virtual experiences and really um, change the way that we could do scientific education. Um, and it's been a wild ride since then, joining oh. in 2019. <laughs> wow, excellent. SJ, that was a whole lot like packed into that. So I know we will no. we'll definitely unpack that as we go through the show and as we continue to talk about Labster. But thank you so much for joining us all the way from the UK. And I want to also welcome Bonnie Nieves to the show. Bonnie, again, we, we talked a little bit pre-chat. I was just so excited. Longtime follower of your work, you know, everything that you do, that you share, that you put out there. I'm definitely always just kind of lurking and seeing the amazing things that you're doing. So thank you so much for what you're doing for the education community as well. So Bonnie, for our audience members that may be watching, tuning in, and maybe just finally getting to know who you are, give us a little introduction about yourself and your context in education. All right. So first of all, SJ is amazing, right? Like I, I can't even believe the, the all of that came from one person's experience, right? It, it's awesome. So I'm thrilled to be able to be here. Um, I am in central Massachusetts. And if you're wondering where you could actually almost put your finger on my house on a globe because I'm right at the junction of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. So there's that. Y'all always know where I am. And I am a high school science teacher. I teach life science, um, anatomy, and physiology, biotechnology, typically. And I am an author. I have the book, Be Awesome on Purpose, through the amazing Edumatch and Dr. Sarah Thomas. And I have started a consulting company um, called Educate on Purpose, and I'm rolling out some new online courses this year. So I'm um, pretty happy about that. And I guess that's me in a nutshell. Wow. Well, I mean, like, yeah, you say that's me in a nutshell, but I mean, if you really follow you and the work that you're doing and the stuff that you're putting out and sharing, I definitely encourage any of one of our listeners and those that are tuning in live to please make sure that you follow both SJ and follow Bonnie. I have been putting in the links there for their LinkedIn and for their Twitter. And obviously they'll be all in the show notes too. So that way you can go ahead and connect after you hear today's awesome conversation. So ladies, let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm interested in hearing about Labster and virtual labs. So, you know, one thing that I loved about this, going to the website and the first thing that to me just 
really popped out was where it says, empower the next generation of scientists. And like I was talking to Bonnie earlier pregame, it's like uh, being a former science teacher, definitely very excited about, you know, giving students those learning experiences, whether it was hands on. Um, I was telling Bonnie, you know, what, when being a science teacher, our science lab wasn't the best equipped. So I was like always at the dollar store buying things that I we can use and we can go ahead and do hands on. But to give those students the experiences and it was wonderful documenting their learning, you know, putting them in stations where they rotate their documenting using their devices to record and being scientists and it's really exciting you know for them so uh we'll start with sj sj your work there through labster tell us a little bit about the just the overall picture of an encompassing goal of labster for sure um, you've really hit the nail on the head when you mentioned you know labs not being always the best equipped especially at high school level um so we kind of have our, our two missions one is very much higher ed and, and high school and when it comes to high school you know, science isn't something that a lot of people really aspire to be in. There's not a lot of scientific capital within the student body. Um, so what's, what Labster really wants to do is create time and space for students to realize their curiosity about science <laughs> and realize it's not just one thing. It's not just biology, it's not just chemistry. There's this whole raft of, um, of intersections within these different disciplines that we think of as discrete. Um, and it can be a lot of fun. And let's be honest, like, who doesn't want to go into a lab and kind of explode the thing <laughs> when you're told not to explode the thing? <laughs> so the, we use a lot of productive failure in the virtual environment to allow students to explore, cu curiously explore the procedures, say, for example, in a, in a technique based lab or to explore the concepts that they don't get to see every day. So say, for example, you're teaching chemistry, you're talking about atomic number, you're never going to be able to show an atom in its native environment so much so you know you go in you take a look see how the protons and neutrons they sit together all that kind of thing and um, it really brings those abstract concepts to life and really helps with mental model building and if we can get those foundations dialed in it just helps students level up as they go through their educational career yeah. so anything we can do for equity building like i think that's at the heart of what labster does best i love that you know a couple of things that you hit on is just yeah, sometimes, you know, the kids, they, they don't say like, oh, man, I'm going to grow up and be a scientist. And well, a couple of things like you mentioned, too, it's like either, you know, labs can be very poorly equipped where they don't get that hands on experience or get to get inspired and mm -hmm. feel like, wow, this is something that I can do. But also just that representation of, hey, you know, wow, that 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 person looks like me and, and they're doing this and something to get them excited about. But, oh, absolutely. It, but mainly it's just like you said, just getting them engaged and getting those experiences mm. that they may never have because uh, that's one thing uh, coming in into education that it kind of had to learn real quick because like I was telling Bonnie, uh, I didn't go through the traditional education route. I came from marketing and sales and coming into education, well, it's about knowing my customers, knowing my mm. students. Uh, and so I always joke with people back in 2005, I was doing personalized learning before it became a buzzword because I had to sell the subject to 30 different customers and not everybody's going to buy it the same way. But what you learn in there real quick is that not everybody's dealt the same cards and, you know, the access that others may have. And so what can we do to make sure that everybody gets these experiences that otherwise they may not have mm -hmm. if they're at home? Uh, because they don't have access, they don't have the technology. So I absolutely love that aspect. So now, Bonnie, I want to uh, jump over to you now, you know, as using this, uh, you know, tell us your experience uh, or the Labster experience for you and how it has worked for you. So the, oh, there's so much to talk about. That's a, that is a huge question. Um, I'll start with the um, building equity using it because there are kids that come from actually at the high school level they potentially could come from a lot of different districts with different backgrounds and different science um, lab experience so with labster it gives kids an opportunity to have an a level starting point right where everyone has this common experience that we can build off of and regardless of the amount of previous experience they have, everyone has an opportunity to use that same, um, that same lab equipment and really 
it actually gives them like a, a hands on feel to it, the way it's built. And there are other, and not that I want to like turn this into an advertisement for it, but the reason why I love it is because there are other labs that show you that you can do simulations and you can manipulate variables, but you don't actually touch the stuff. And this is as close as you can get to actually physically touching things and manipulating and moving and then seeing what happens. Mm. So for the students that maybe are transferring in from a different school that have no uh, lab experience in their nine years of school, to sit next to a kid in a, in a physical lab setting they're at a significant disadvantage unless they've had some experience like this to be able to get in and try things out and see what things look like when they don't go right and um, really experience science in a, in a safe way before they get into a lab and yeah. actually do blow things up. <laughs> we had a, a really interesting anecdote from a student in Northumbria University in the UK who um, <laughs> had a slightly Pavlovian response to the, the sound of a pipette clicking in a virtual lab and she's like oh no I know where I am I know what I'm doing this is so comforting and she liked that the labster experience transferred in that way the like familiar sounds and the familiar sights I was like whatever works for you sister that's amazing yeah. <laughs> I love that I love that yes. well, we're already getting some love here we've got Maggie thank you so much Maggie for joining us on the show and she was very thankful for the update on the tools with some pros like yourself but she said this she goes she already sent the link to the science department head already as we're having this conversation oh, so super. thank you so much Maggie for joining us and for sharing this info uh, so yeah let's talk a little bit more about that SJ as I'm kind of going here through the website and of course we do have some questions that I do want to ask that we're going to dive in. But what I'm seeing here is I love the fact that I can go in and explore labs. And right now, currently, you have labs for the levels that are in high school, for professional and university and college. Now, will there be maybe any plans in the future for making labs for the maybe elementary space that would be made available? It's something that we're definitely interested in looking at. I think one of the things that's very difficult about building for elementary is just um, it's less to do with lobster and science and more to do with how acceptable is a virtual environment to a, a child that's at that stage in their cognitive development. So I think we need to understand that a little bit more before we start dipping into the elementary space. But I think there's absolutely an opportunity to use simulation education with that, that kind of grade level of student. Already like mantle of the expert, using role play, these are all things that are so important for developing critical skills at that level. But leveraging them in our virtual environment, that's where the the real magic's going to be. So I look forward to exploring that for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring that too, because that would be <laughs> just something wonderful. And I, now that technology, because of COVID, a lot of, you know, school districts, they are one to one. So students mm -hmm. do have access to those devices. And uh, of course, you know, here in Texas, really, it's just science really starts the, the state testing starts in fifth grade. And it's yeah. fifth, eighth and ninth, I believe that's when they do the state testing. So just something, an additional layer mm -hmm. of teaching and having that hands-on component would definitely be something very beneficial where they can manipulate. Uh, Bonnie, so talk to us a little bit more too, as far as now diving in into the teaching experience and with the labs. Uh, I know we've hit on a couple of things here, but just from your experience, let's say, you know, what is it that you see your students when you're able to use uh, this platform? What are you getting from their, your students, their reactions, or maybe what was their initial reaction when you might have first introduced it and how you've seen that change? Yeah, this is something I've been really um, wanting to talk about because I, if you follow me on social media, I, I don't just post the pretty stuff, right? This there, There's going to be some sort of bumps in the road. So um, I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, we started using Labster and right away every kid was like, oh, can we do that again? it it wasn't that smooth there they really enjoyed it at first and i mean it's because we did the um we did the body uh, oh sj maybe you can help me with the particular name of it it was the body planes with the chimpanzee oh yeah body planes and sections it's just okay. about how learning how the different orientation of the body and the words we use to describe different parts yes yes so at the end there's this part where they're collecting fruit 
and <laughs> they give the but they give the chimpanzee different types of fruit and it so it takes an apple it eats it it takes a pear it eats it but you give it a banana and it dances <laughs> so that was that was it they're like oh my gosh this is so fabulous I'm like did you get your monkey to dance did your monkey dance <laughs> what kind of fruit did you give it so they were having so much fun but that happened at the end so that was actually really good to build their anticipation to see what would happen next time and yeah. the next time we did the lab safety which was where they have to learn and this is another great thing about labster is you have to put on your gloves and a lab coat every time you walk in the lab. That's just what you do every single time. So it trains them for real life, but then they're going through all these things where they get to actually explode things and do things incorrectly. And, and see the consequences. <laughs> yes. So there's there's these kids and I just imagine there's this bank of computers in our in our computer lab and there's a bunch of kids at the same point in the lab and they're going through and they spilled something in their eyes mm -hmm. and they have to go over to the eye wash, but you have to get there quickly because if you don't, Labster will make you go blind for life. And <laughs> the kids are like trying to do it over and over. And the kid next door is going, oh my gosh, hold on, let me help you or you'll be blind for life. And they get so <laughs> Emotion, they invest. <laughs> they do. So at that point, they're really invested in it. So that's really wonderful. But what the real the real thing that I love most about it is that it builds perseverance because they're not all of the simulations are not that way. They're not all all gamey and they're not all super super fun in that way, but they're really rewarding. And there are kids that are the kids that aren't familiar with computers because there are actually still some kids left that don't use computers 24 hours a day. They have some difficulty uh, maneuvering in the environment and it takes them some time to get used to. So the we've been using it weekly for oh my gosh, I think since October. And now at this point, every student actually does say, oh, this is Labster Day, right? We get to go down and, and do the Labsters. And in their science fair research that they're working on, they're actually citing their Labster experiences in their, um, in their science sorry in their um science fair research papers so it it does take some time for kids to get used to maneuvering in that environment because it is the most realistic simulation i've ever seen and then once they do then they're all in with it so if you're a teacher that's trying it and the kids start to lose their enthusiasm please stick with it because it really really will be worth it Excellent. Now, Bonnie, I didn't get to ask, but uh, what grade level is it that you are using Labster with? I right now I'm using it with 10th, 11th and 12th graders. And okay. that's a variety. I have a co-taught science class and I have honors. So it's with every every academic level. Excellent. Well, you know, everything that you described is just wonderful as far as, you know, some of that gamification components, that enthusiasm and that sense of realism. Now, again, I know it's very different and there can be many people that might be of the opinion of, well, it's everything is virtual and it's on a device and, and it's not the same. But, you know, we got to think about, you know, if we don't have that access in our schools and we don't have, you know, the proper lab setting for them. I mean, this seems like it is a great alternative, ver uh, you know, alternative to it. And SJ, one thing that I love, too, that you mentioned was also and Bonnie, too, is that you do see the consequences if the experiment is not followed correctly you will see what can happen mm -hmm. and of course we see you know in this example of you know hey if you don't wash your eyes you're <laughs> going to be going blind for life and so the students are there helping each other out so that mm -hmm. way you know they don't go through that but sure. again it, it's an alternative and what i see the benefit again going back to my teaching experience is being able to break down the walls from your classrooms and for myself was 
taking students to where they might not otherwise have an opportunity to go to, whether because of demographics, you know, socioeconomic status and access to certain things. But if you are able to bring that into the classroom for everybody to enjoy on a level playing field and be able to interact, such as you're mm -hmm. describing to me, that sounds like a win because the students are engaging and the learning. And Bonnie, too, I want to thank you for just being very open and honest and saying like, hey, it didn't quite start off all great, but the more consistent you were and the more you practice, the better it got. And the students were really enjoying those experiences. So I'm very thankful for that. So that's great. All right. So again, so high school, professional and university setting. So for yourself this time, I'm going to start with Bonnie and then we'll move uh, to SJ. So Bonnie, now with your the experience that you have in the, your grade levels, do you see now as far as that engagement piece, students maybe even just talking a little bit more of like, hey, you know, this is something that I would like to pursue and maybe getting a bigger interest for that track, whether it's through STEM, you know, or specifically here, science, chemistry, biology, and, and moving on in that. What has been your experience? Oh, ab absolutely. And as a science teacher, like that, I'm sure every science teacher has the same goal. Like one of my kids is going to go on to become a scientist. This is at least one, this is my goal. And there are kids that come in. Now, before I used simulations, there would be kids that would come into the lab and all of this new and foreign equipment, no matter how much prep time is really intimidating because they've seen people use it on like a forensics show or on a crime show, but I, I just a 12 year old, I can't use this yeah. stuff. So having the simulated experience first gives them a much bigger comfort level. So they come in and they're, they're already a novice at it. So they can actually become an expert instead of going from someone with no experience to eventually becoming a novice. And there are kids that are talking to themselves about themselves in a more positive way. And I think that is amazing. So even like conversations that I have on a regular basis are things like, wow, I can't believe I knew that. That That's pretty neat. And I say, yeah, that's because you're a genius. <laughs> and you may not have known that yet, but now you do. So that's the type of thing that Labster can do. It, it builds up confidence. So they're not intimidated by the things that typically would be. Excellent. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. So AJ, A, uh, excuse me, SJ, going uh, back to you, hearing Bonnie's experience, you know, again, going through that lab setting, you know, getting the students getting used to it. But now those conversations of feeling empowered and feeling like, hey, I can totally do this and I get this. For you working at Lobster, what does that do for you? And <laughs> what does that do for everybody that you're working with there? Um, so at Lobster, we're very much a remote first organization. We're, we're spread across the globe. We've got me in, in the UK, but lots of our uh, artist teams that build all the, the 3D assets that you see and love in the lab, um, including that beautiful visual effect when you go blind in lab safety. <laughs> They're based in Indonesia a lot of the time, spread across Europe um, and over in Boston too. So we're everywhere. And I love that the the player, the, the, the student experience in our labs is something that really unifies everybody across the entire company. Like we're all thinking, you know, how can we how can we improve the UX of these labs? How can we ensure that the types of mini games that were designed and that they're true to life or that they permit failure in the correct way. And Bonnie and I talked about this a little bit before. Like we want to make sure that when, when we sit to design a simulation, one of the first, first things we do, especially if it's a practical-based simulations, we start by thinking, what are all the ways that this can go wrong? <laughs> like, how can it go wrong? How is a student going to misinterpret or misunderstand what's going on right now? And we start from the points of failure. And from there, we're kind of trying to understand, we're doing user research to understand where do they go wrong? Where are the mental models generally uh, broken or need reinforcement? So we're trying to build our simulations to be sympathetic to the, the typical student that's going to be encountering them and anticipating where those points of failure in a simulation might exist so that we can put a learning practice around them. The difference between a virtual lab or any kind of simulation education really and being able to teach in, 
in, in class or teach in person is that you can be responsive in the moment, whereas in a virtual lab, everything has to be there ready to go. So if we don't have a, a teaching loop or a thought loop or a remediation action to, to solve a problem or to solve for a stuck issue, then we need to fix it. So I love taking that chance to really dig into the nuts and bolts of a practical technique or a concept that's particularly difficult to understand. And then thinking about how can we take our student on a journey through this in a story-based accessible way that they can see the, the kind of magic behind it and see how it works. Not just get the practical done. We're not kind of like output based like that. It's like, how can I take you on this journey so you know why we do it this way, what it's useful for, and how you can do it successfully and be reproducibly successfully in the lab. Um, and I think if we can do that effectively, we can, exactly what Bunny said, we can reduce that cognitive load that the student experiences when they go into the lab for the first time. Like we forget labs smell weird. We three, we're all science people. We know what a lab smells like. But when you first smell it, especially if it's chemistry, you're like, eggs, ah. <laughs> That, that sensory overload, like if we can reduce the cognitive load of like, I've been here before, I know what this equipment is, I know what the procedure is going to look like, you've got more RAM available to deal with the weird smells and the lab coat and the textures and the sensations and the weird lighting. So anything we can do to make somebody feel that little bit more comfortable and engage with the experience in a meaningful way. I think I think that's awesome. That's and it's so encouraging to hear Bonnie kind of latching in and we're only one part of the story, right? Bonnie's crafted this whole scenario around use in virtual labs that really enriches the experience and, it, and ensures that the students take something away from it. It's just a, not a one shot that's done in an isolated space and time. It's part of the curriculum. Excellent. Now, one thing that I loved, SJ, that you mentioned was going through the experience and actually kind of getting the why you're doing this. And again, oftentimes in education, I mean, it is so fast paced. You got to go through a curriculum and it's just go, 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 go. And students are just Boom, here we go. We're just going to go right through it. And there's no room for the why. Like, why are we doing it this way? No, well, this is just the way it's going to be done. And just follow these rules mm -hmm. and follow this and everything. But what I love that you said is just the goal is to not just be output based. And oftentimes, in my experience working in a school district with the myriad of platforms that are out there, a lot of it is just output based. It's like, okay, do this okay, here's the output, do this, here's the output. But the way that you describe Labster and the way that I'm imagining it too is just being able to go through this step by step. You're still putting in, you're seeing results. But I love that you said we want to add that why component. Why are we doing it this way? That oftentimes as a teacher, you may not have that time because either your, your time is so short and, you know, in my district, we do what is called block schedule. So students only see, for example, their biology teacher, they'll only see them from, I guess, what, August through December, and mm -hmm. that's it. And then they move wow. on to their next science. So mm -hmm. time is something that is valuable. So that's why a lot of students may yeah. miss out on those. So that's one thing that I love that you mentioned that Labster offers. Yeah. How frustrating is it, though? I remember as a student, and I'm a perpetual student, so you know, I'm in the middle of a welding course right now. <laughs> how frustrating is it to be told, this is how we do the thing. Do the thing exactly as I'm telling you to do it. And you go, well, why? Surely it would be easier to do it this way. And it's like, don't mess about. Do it the way I've told you. I find that incredibly frustrating. And I think a lot of students do too, especially when you're a budding you've got the curiosity to ask that question and then somebody comes along and squishes it, right? Yeah. So if you can play a simulation and get your whys out <laughs> and maybe satisfy some of them themselves, the sense of accomplishment of discovering the why can be enough to maybe drive a little bit of intrinsic motivation to stick with the course, get the course finished, right? So just little touches, little boosts along the way to really empower the teacher, <laughs> empower mm -hmm. the bunnies of the world to have students that are coming to the class ready to engage as well, you know? I love that. Now, SJ, I just have to ask, because now I'm curious, <laughs> is, 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 is your welding course an in-person or is it a virtual welding course? It's hybrid. Ah, okay. There you go. It's See, I was, I was curious. I just had to ask because I just wanted to double check. So I still yeah. have to be assessed in person. I have to be able to demonstrate that I can weld. But a lot of my teaching components are sent through video to learn weave patterns and things like that. So it helps keep the course affordable. 
um because we're not going through so much metal and the price of metal um but i turn up to class understanding what particular welding patterns are and then i try and do them <laughs> excellent thank you so much for sharing that so bonnie i, I want to go back to you now getting on the teacher side now that sj you know one of the things that she touched on was you know that in it's not just an output you've mm. described a little bit about how the course works for you what you've seen but for you as a teacher you know how important or what it how big has the impact been of being able to use lobster as far as being in that time crunch? Now, I'm not sure how your classes are scheduled, but I mentioned here in our district, it's block schedule and it's like three months, you're in, you're out and you move on. I'm not sure how things may run over there, but as far as the time for you, how has mm -hmm. a lobster been a game changer? So there's a lot of things I have to say about that. I'll start with, um, I have full year classes and we have one hour long blocks. So um, they it, we're on a five and we're on a seven drop two schedule. So we rotate wow. and um, I see kids for just about four hours a week. But um, with that being said, I spend a lot of time on building executive functioning and social emotional skills. So anytime I can save time somewhere else is really important. What I ended up doing and how Labster has helped me with that is not only having the kids prepared for a lab before they come into it, but also giving that bit of time for myself to step back while kids are working on the interactive, they're talking to each other. I can have them work in partners and um, like then they're building their social, emotional and um, collaborative skills while they're doing that. But because I don't have to be supervising kids with actual glassware and chemicals and things like that, I can go around and have conversations about, oh, that's an interesting choice. Why did you decide to put that bacterium in that Petri dish? Right. So it lends itself to lots of other conversations. And that's, um, I don't know if that really saves time because I'm, I'm spending my time doing something else, but it, um, it changes the way I use my time. Let's, let's just say that it has really provided some important space for other skills. Yeah. And you know, what I like about that is that now you said, you know, you have that you don't think it saves you time, but I mean, you're using your time in a different way. But I think just the fact that you're able to dive in deeper. And again, just through my experience, it's very much just sometimes it's just very superficial. You just go through things because you either a self contained teacher in elementary where you're teaching all subjects. So you got to like, go, 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 go. Uh, and then, of course, you, sometimes you fall into those love lessons where there may be teachers that may not feel comfortable with certain subjects because they haven't taught it in a while. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now I'm teaching this. So it's kind of very superficial. But the fact that here with Lobster allows you to see that students to see that lab setting. But now you can go into deeper conversations with them and the, the whys and the hows and what do you think and all of that. And I think that I find that very awesome like i'm just so excited about it right now and i'm like oh. man if i was in school and i had something like this I, I, just the types of conversations that i would be able to engage with with my students and what i could be able to draw out from them that they've never thought of before mm -hmm. and giving them that experience is just something that's great because those skills become transferable i mean it's not just for science but they can use them in all areas of their curriculum and so i think that that's something that is wonderful so uh, now, Bonnie, I'll start with you again now this time. So as far as the cost effectiveness of this, I know you mentioned, you know, you don't have to worry about buying chemicals. You don't have to worry about buying maybe like, uh, you know, fetal pigs or anything of that sort. So how has your district embraced lobster on that side? <laughs> so as a district, we haven't adopted it. It's um, myself using okay. it with all of my students. Okay. So um, I have 125 students mm -hmm. using it. So if you can just, um, well, first of all, the comparison of Labster to another simulated lab um, company is a lot less. 
and I'll just leave it at that because I don't, I don't pay the bills at the school, but I do do some, um, some research, but imagine paying for the lab equipment for 125 students and to make the labs meaningful at the same time. What I've found over years, what districts try to do is um, put kids into bigger lab groups. So instead of working in pairs, students would work in threes. And we know that threes don't work because there's always one kid that gets left out somehow when there's an odd number. Oh, takes and the then, state back. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there's just, there's too many hands and it actually becomes dangerous at, at some point. So, um, the optimal number for a lab is typically in pairs. So it's a significant cost to do physical labs for, especially for every single thing. So as a teacher now, I can choose the labs that I think would be best for um, like actually manipulative hands-on labs and choose which ones are the most cost effective and use Labster for everything else. Like there's, it's um, like we have not even talked about all of the variety of wonderful labs they have, the resources that they have, and the support that's built into it. It um, again, I'm not trying to sound like an advertisement, but it's a phenomenal yeah. product. And just listening to SJ talk about how like all of the thought that is put into the design of it is evident from the minute you start using it. I, yeah. I was in love with it the minute I opened it up and there was this bobbing doctor one that was there to answer <laughs> all of my questions. It's like, whoa, and tell you jokes. I mean, she's, she's just, yeah, wonderful she'll tell you terrible jokes. <laughs> they, are, they are terrible. <laughs> Yeah, send me all of your suggested jokes uh, to my LinkedIn address. Uh, for anyone who's listening, jokes are always welcome. You make yeah. a really good point, though, that, Bonnie, you're optimizing your labs. This isn't like a direct replacement thing. Nothing is going to replace time in the lab with your hands on a pipette. Get developing that manual dexterity. Mm -hmm. But to hear you talk about, like, the optimization is is so interesting especially to me because i'm like hmm, well which which labs are the most <laughs> you know which ones are the most expensive to be able to offer an alternative or offer support for them you know yeah um so i love that you've struck that that harmony between the manual dexterity development and the cognitive development around procedural based learning that sounds so cool yeah that was uh so that's what i was gonna lead up sorry to, but no but it's great i'm like this is awesome but this is awesome this is what makes it so much fun you know just being able to just share freely and then just you know uh play off of you know other people's ideas and comments and everything which i think to me was something that was so beneficial because oftentimes at at a district and working at a district level it's just once those requisition sheets come and it's like dollar sign, dollar sign, it's like, no, no. And it's scary because there's a budget. You only have so much that you can allocate. But if being able to see things through the lens like Bonnie shared right now, where you can maximize, you know, with certain labs that you can offer that, but still keep those that you really need the students to really get that hands on approach. And like SJ was mentioning that manual dexterity, all of that. I think that that is something that is very, very beneficial. So I'm really excited about that. And another thing that Bonnie hit on that I want to talk to SJ about is SJ, the, you know, right now, uh, Labster, as far as simulations are concerned, how many simulations does Labster have available right now? We hit 300 literally just before Christmas. <laughs> so we have 300, I think fingers crossed that we can do a launch we should have 306 by the end of next week and um, so we're turning out new simulations all the time and um, i've been really excited to see especially the the dedicated um high school teams and their content production because we've only really been exploring high school specific right. laboratory development for the past kind of 18 months um, and the output is just phenomenal. There's a particular ones that are not to sound like an advert. I'm just really proud of them. <laughs> I'm proud of the work that Anastasia and her team have been doing. Um, Anastasia is like our high school product manager um, around fusion and fission. Um, so things that are really difficult for a student to cognitively 
get into their brain like what do you mean it becomes <laughs> anyway and one thing that I was really encouraged by is that we'd explored co-creation with a, with a high school teacher as well and um, so we were like if we're really going to build something that's got true value for, for a high school educator we need to involve them in the process so in this occasion we had a high school teacher she came along the journey with us she is so enthusiastic just like talking about this is why I think fusion is the most important thing this is why I think it's really exciting and her enthusiasm really rubbed off on the simulation development team and there's always a scientist in that team so we have scientific content creators who are at least bachelors if not masters or PhD level educated scientists in a particular field embedded within the simulation creation team and just the enthusiasm of this scientific person plus the co-creator with a team of people who just genuinely want to build something that's fun that's informative that's accurate that's going to help someone it was magnificent so these two simulations especially i cannot wait for them to be unleashed upon the world <laughs> that is great you know, <laughs> They're gonna I, be cool. <laughs> I love i love love that you know how you're including educators in this and giving educators voice <laughs> because for many years many years it's you know companies will put out products but they've been so far removed and it's what they think ha needs to be done, uh, mm. maybe based on research. But really, when you get into the classrooms, you may see like, well, we're really kind of focusing on something that's very different or what we thought was the the answer to this problem or, you mm. know, it's definitely not. It's just something that um, is very important. So I, I really love that, that you do take into account you know, the teacher voice, that yeah. teacher experience, along with, of course, your your science creators that are out there that have that experience. And so that's wonderful, just being able oh, to sure. marry those ideas and then just bring a product that wonderful teachers like Bonnie and anybody mm -hmm. else might be able to bring to their students. Go ahead, mm -hmm. SJ, you were going to say something? No, it's just, it's interesting because it's been so... <sighs> There was a massive change at Labster. We used to make a lot of simulations that were very practical oriented and it was about learning procedures and learning techniques in a safe way, which is awesome. And we made such a pivot over the past 18 months around including more conceptual simulations because during the pandemic, especially, we got a lot of feedback around, it's great that we can teach them this lab technique, but they still don't understand the, the founding theories behind it. How can we make that more visible and engaging? So I'm just thinking about that fishing simulation. It's not a practical simulation. It's a, it's a living concept within the virtual lab, the virtual experience, so they can manipulate the very fabric of physics. <laughs> and it's trying to help understand the theory so that when we do come to apply those ideas in a practical scenario in a problem-based teaching scenario we understand the the lego bricks that make it up <laughs> yes. and can think positively about it so yeah there is a big change recently in supporting that that knowledge-based learning that needs to happen as well as the, the skills-based learning Excellent. Thank you so Super much. Cool. Well, before we wrap up, though, so Bonnie, I just want to come back to you. Now, I know you've said some amazing things about Lapster, and of course, you're not necessarily trying to advertise, but that experience that you have, what I've heard from you is just how valuable it is. I love the fact that you've been able to pick and choose what it is that you need and how you've been able to customize your class and your your course based on what Lapster has available. And then, of course, what you need to teach. So uh, if you can just share before we kind of wrap up and in, into the last segment for you, what the biggest takeaways that you would love our audience members or anybody who's just learning about Lapster for the very first time, what are maybe your top three takeaways from Lapster that you feel are going to be beneficial to science teachers that can that would be using Lobster. They're going to give kids a a level of knowledge that. Um, oh boy, sorry about that. I just completely like thought. Well, maybe I should say something else. So, their kids can move at their own pace through these activities and still have notes available to them. Because another thing that we haven't even touched upon is the there's this thing called a lab pad in Labster that is a, a box that hides down in the bottom of the screen. But when kids need help, they can click on it and it opens up and they can read a set of notes and get answers for themselves. So kids can move through, dig deeper at their own pace and that is incredibly valuable. And another one of those time things that teachers don't know, where do I find the time to do that? This naturally um, builds in the time for that. And 
The second thing would be perseverance. It's different than most things kids have done before. It takes them some time to get used to all of the different ways of using a mouse and a keyboard and um, seeing things that are completely different, learning new vocabulary before they get into the lab. And the last thing is, and what surprised me, is how kids really remember because it's this really sensory experience that they um, they can see things and touch things and re they remember so um, so vividly that they can refer back to it later and kids come to me and say things like oh there was that thing that, that I did I don't remember the name but I was looking at this and I learned about this so I'd like the notes from that section, like, wonderful. I know exactly where that is based on how you described it. And they really just wanted to use that so they could cite information that they already had. They didn't need to remember the information. They just needed to remember where it came from so they could cite it. So they had the knowledge and the, the vision to match with it. It was pretty pretty cool. Excellent. That is yeah. wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie, for sharing that. SJ, thank you so much for just the wealth of knowledge that you shared. <laughs> Your experiences have been just something so valuable and just really get me excited and pumped up today. But before we wrap up, this is our last segment, and this is one of my favorite segments. So we'll kind of go back and forth as far as questions. And I always love to end the show with the following three questions. However, I did change one of the questions just for this episode. So, uh, but <laughs> So it's basically what we got. rehearsed. No, 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 no. It, it's, no. Well, it's because usually, <laughs> usually, I'll, I'll, I, I actually, I, I ask, always ask a question at the end. It says, you know, if this was your podcast, what would be one question you like to ask me? But I changed that. So the questions that you did rehearse are the same questions that you're gonna get. I was just <laughs> putting that out there. For you. Because I, I will have, I will have, I can think of one audience member that will call me out and say, hey, why didn't you ask him the podcast question? So I just wanted to say a disclaimer there. All right. So uh, we'll start with Bonnie first. So Bonnie, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? My edu kryptonite is grades. Yep. I, I do not like that. I have to provide a score on things that I may or may not agree with. That's a snapshot in time mm. that may impact a student for a very long time. Oof, good answer. I like that. And I just like the fact that you emphasize it's like, it's just, a, it's a snapshot for that moment in time. All right. SJ to you. In the current state of education, from your experience, you know, at Lapster and what you see, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? Now, me and Bonnie are very well aligned on this. Okay. <laughs> My edu kryptonite is the fact that we have a lot of educational scenarios that are developing the scientists of the future without actually assessing whether or not they can do the thing that they're trying to get to. So output-based assessment rather than outcomes-based assessment is my kryptonite. Mm, nice. I'd like to see more realistic, true-to-life forms of assessment being taken in the courses, especially where there's practical component. Um, yes. Excellent. Make the assessment match the teaching. <laughs> Great answer, SJ. Great answer. All right, SJ, we'll start with you this time. Now, what's one thing that you are excited about education right now? So I'm going to be a bit of a Brit about this one. So forgive me, American audience members, um, but I know the same is true in the US right now, but we're seeing such a beautiful and elegant resurgence in the value that we place on voca uh, vocational and technical education in the UK right now. And I love that we are seeing uh, school leavers, especially aged, age, or even 14 year olds in the UK, we're doing a lot of technical education, 14 to 18 pre-university. They're following their curiosity and their passions rather than the graded subjects that they are good at. 
and maybe not taken the traditional academic um, pathways that maybe their parents did or their grandparents did, but instead they're forging out on their own path based on things that they're interested in, that they think are valuable to them and to society at large. So I think I'm really excited to see how technical and vocational education changes in the future, especially with some of the technological advancements that uh, are coming up <laughs> over the next few years. But I think it's it's just so valuable to see the these these skills being valued again and being active pursued. Excellent. I love that. Great answer. Bonnie, on to you. What is one thing that you are excited about that's going on in education right now? Um, my answer is a little bit shallow, but it's chat GPT. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love it so much. Oh my gosh. And my, my, my kids are super excited about it because I'm super excited about it. And the conversations are just so varied, but my favorite conversation from this week was, it's funny how my English teacher is telling me that chat GPT is the devil. And over here, you're so excited and you use it all day long. <laughs> like, yes, because it's the future. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I, I think for myself is like, if, if you're asking a question that can easily be found through a Google search, we're asking the wrong type of questions. The and, wrong question, yes. Yeah, the wrong type of question. So, <laughs> you know, and, and the thing is too, I, I, I did a little mini episode and, and I described my experience and I was really aging myself when, you know, I was in grade school and elementary, I think it was fourth grade when we started doing like little research papers. My mom would drop me off at the library and here I go with the Encyclopedia Britannica, these big books. <laughs> and then I have to do a science uh, research paper on spiders or something. So, okay, so I would just open to the section on spiders and there I am just copying because nobody, yeah, I'm just getting the information, mm -hmm. you know? So, and then of course Google comes and it's like, oh, that's it. You know, Google has everything now. And now, oh, Chad GPT, well, I mean, come on, we, we really need to adapt to what's <sighs> coming, the future of education, the future of learning, the future of work, and not being scared to navigate these waters. For me, it's I always encourage teachers, it's like, hey, just get clicky with it, have some fun, see what the potential is. And if it's something that can save you some time, then I'm all for it. You know, if I can give you 10 minutes extra in your day where you can just sit there with mm -hmm. the lights off at your desk, decompressing, I think that's a win. I'll take that. And if yes. we can help you with that, then that would be great. But then, of course, you've got the other side where it's like, oh, well, now they're just going to be using this and they're going to be cheating and they're going to be doing mm -hmm. this. I was like, I think that you know your students and if they write and you build those relationships with them, you're going to know their style. They're going to need to put their own spin on it. They're going to need to just really learn how to express themselves. I see this as just a little base to help just kind of yep. start that writer's block approach mm -hmm. and just go through there. You're still going to have to cite sources. Yes. You're still going to have to do all of that, but don't dismiss it's almost like it. like we need to redesign the assessment, isn't it? Almost yeah. like it needs to fit. Yes. Yeah. I was yeah. like, don't dismiss it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't dismiss it. <laughs> That's what I'm and, saying. And using it to write essays is just such a waste of its potential. And I, I was just curious and I typed into it, what would be a good vegan meal to have? And it just it just gave me suggestions. And I'm going to have a stuffed sweet potato for lunch today because <laughs> that's what he suggested today. It, it just it's like a, a thought partner. Yeah, that's I, you. I love it. I love it. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, last question, and we'll start with Bonnie uh, now. It says if you could have a billboard with anything on it. What would it be and why? It would say, what is the best thing that happened to you today? Because I know for myself, I tend to really um, concentrate on negativity. And when I learned from Mr. Chris Quinn on Twitter, how to be more positive about everything, it changed my entire life. Excellent. I love that because sometimes all it takes is just that one thing that you can yeah. go back and think about and it just changes everything where, like yeah. you said, that negative, it's like, what, what am I even focusing on that? Because, And I'm with you, Bonnie. Many times I hyper-focus on that one little negative yeah. thing and completely forget about all the great things that happened. But mm -hmm. that's just sometimes in our nature. All right, SJ, question for you now. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? See, I feel like Bonnie and I are like the devil and the angel sitting on your shoulder right now on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
Bunny is, I've, what I've learned about Bunny in the short time I've been talking is she is an eternal optimist and it fills me with joy. <laughs> My billboard is going to say, does it have to be like that? And <laughs> because I come often from a place of like that really grinds my gears or like frustration. I, I am a person who feels frustration deeply, but I, I need a constructive way to deal with it. So rather than sitting there being frustrated and angry, I want to turn it into something constructive and think, well, does it have to? How could it be different? I want to inspire the curiosity to want to change it in the future, you know. Um, being a simulation director wasn't a job that existed when I was doing my bachelor's degree all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And yet here I am uh, doing something that I really love and enjoy and get to share with people. So, I love yeah, it. does it have to be like that? <laughs> love it. No, but that's great. That's great because that's oftentimes the questions that I have when we're in our meetings. I'm like, why do we keep doing it this way? And I'm, I'm going to quote Amy Meyer, who was on the show. She's from Fry Technology. And her saying is like, we suffer from the twatty, which is the, this is the way we've always done it approach. And that is the biggest killer of everything. So why does it have to be that way? Well, because this is the way we've always done it. Well, it hasn't been working, but they still stick to it. So that's one of those things. So thank you, SJ, for sharing. But I have a little surprise because, and and I'm going to have, I have one extra Bonus question for SJ because she <laughs> is from the UK and I have a lot of friends from the UK. Uh, but one question to you is clotted cream first or don't. Who do you think you are talking about? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to cause a so, rift. <laughs> I'm curious. Clotted cream first or jam first? The controversial answer is it depends on the consistency of the jam. If the jam is runny, the cream must go on first. If the jam is solid, the jam goes on, the cream goes over the top. You have to assess the ingredients in front of you to find the right answer. All right. I'll take that. I love that. Very political. I love it. Great answer. Well, ladies, it has been an honor. It has been a pleasure. I'm so thankful for just the joy that you brought in this conversation. I'm so thankful for sharing your experiences your enthusiasm for education. And this is this is what I love about doing this, just connecting with amazing educators like yourselves from around the world, sharing your experiences and sharing them with everybody that will be listening to this show. So thank you so, so much from the bottom of my heart and to all our audience members that joined us this morning. Thank you so much for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. Please make sure that you stop by our website at myedtech.life myedtech.live to check out this episode and the other 163 amazing episodes from wonderful educators around the world where you can take a couple of things, little uh, knowledge nuggets that you can sprinkle to what you are already doing great. And as you know, our mission is to connect educators and creators one show at a time. And if you love to support our mission, please make sure you stop by our store where you can go ahead and get yourself some uh, My EdTech Life mm -hmm. merch. We've got some sweaters, we've got some hats, we've got mugs, we've got caps. So if you want to contribute to our mission, please do so by doing that. Thank you, as always, for all the likes, shares, and follows. Please make sure that you share this amazing episode. And again, thank you. Thank you so much. All of the contact information for SJ and Bonnie will be in the show notes, and the show will be posted up shortly in about 45 minutes or so, so you can go ahead and catch that. But as always, don't forget, my friends, stay techie. Yes.